this computer. Um, so today on Skype Scientists, we're going to be talking about clean energy and batteries and how all of that uh, is going to influence our lives over the next, uh, hopefully, soon, because we got to move to prevent uh, climate change from being worse than it could be, I guess. So, um, but let's introduce our experts. We've got three. We've got Alex, John, and Miguel. Thank you, all three of you, from being here or for being here and joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, us. happy to be here. Great. So do each of you want to introduce yourselves, say who you are, what you do, and why you like it, and then we'll launch into Q&A? Perfect. Sure. Great. Yes, I can start. Um, so I'm Alex. I'm a PhD student um, here at Georgia Tech, and I actually use electrochemistry to build um, different electrodes and sensors to measure molecules that bacteria produce to talk to each other and also to, I guess, hurt you when you get an infection. So we, we amongst the electrochemistry group here, very similar fundamental techniques. Um, and so we work together to, um, to build those sensors. And of course they use them for other applications um, like batteries. So everybody, my name is uh, John Grunwald. I am also a, chem a PhD student. I am a fifth year P uh, chemical engineering PhD student in Georgia Tech. Um, I'm here today with Alex and Miguel from the Electrochemical Society at Georgia Tech. So what we work with is that we try to use electrochemistry for different energy applications and as well as other applications throughout um, in both industrial and academic research. My specific research is in fuel cells. So a lot of my research is trying to understand how we can make better fuel cells for both vehicle applications, as well as just energy applications in general. A lot of my research is basically just modeling how a fuel cell works. I also work with batteries. I work with solid state lithium ion batteries to try to improve both the design and modeling of those batteries as well. Yeah. And hey everyone, my name is Miguel Gonzalez. I'm a fourth year PhD student from Alton, Georgia Tech. I'm actually in John's lab. Um, I work in high capacity lithium ion batteries. So basically my goal is to try to make batteries in the future so they can last much longer um, using you know, high capacity sort of electrodes and really making them last much longer. So currently available batteries usually use graphite and usually last around 500 to 1000 cycles. Um, my goal is to go into the next generation of materials such as silicon, magnetite and whatnot and make it last for like 10,000 cycles. That is the ultimate ideal goal. Very cool. So just for a start, let's let's assume that everyone in the audience, um, which may or may not include me, just like don't know the first thing about how we store energy um, and like what a fuel cell even is. What what makes a battery a battery and what is a fuel cell? Let's start there. So I can start. Or, so um, basically what a fuel cell is, is if you can think of your battery like, you know, let's say you, look, you got like a double A battery inside of your, you know, your remote control or controller or anything like that. You could think of a fuel cell as kind of a battery that has a continuous power source to it. So for example, for a fuel cell, a fuel cell is the reaction of creating water. So you use hydrogen and oxygen, react those together and make water and energy. So in a battery, what a battery has, so like for example, an alkaline battery, like we were describing these AA batteries, they do a, a, they do a chemical reaction inside of it. That can, all those sources are inside of the, like the, the Duracell battery itself. That paste inside of there is where that reaction occurs. Whereas in a fuel cell, you're flowing hydrogen gas and oxygen gas into the fuel cell itself and performing the reaction to make the energy. Very cool. Um, great, if anybody has questions, please submit them uh, to the Q&A. Oh, we've got a lot of questions coming in from Brooklyn. Uh, let's get in to it. Here we go. Um, what inspired you all to go into chemical engineering? Yeah, so I could answer that maybe. Um, so for me, it was really, I didn't want to make a change in the energy world. Um, I had the experience, you know, I was born in Colombia, and when I was growing up, we had a lot of energy insecurities. I remember there was like, at night, there were certain days that you couldn't use electricity past a certain point, right? So really from an early age, I knew I kind of wanted to make a change as best as I could. And in, in going to school and undergrad and stuff like that, I learned about, you know, physics, things like that. But for me, it was always kind of like the application of things. How can we do something with our hands to really try to make a change? And that's why, you know, I chose chemical engineering because for me, I felt like it was the most widespread sort of thing. 
And I wasn't sure coming in into grad school that I wanted to do, for example, energy consumption or energy storage or something like that. And it really kind of, in my opinion, gave us the biggest, the, me the biggest tools to be able to explore different sort of areas of science and different things. And then eventually, you know, I honed in what I'm doing, which is battery research. Um, and it allowed me to give me a good tool set for anything I wanted to do. Yeah, and going off of that, if you like to tinker with things, if you like to take things apart, if you want to like open, you know, pop the hood up off a car and kind of see what's inside, I feel like the electrochemistry and the battery stuff is like, is, is great. You'll love it. Um, you'll also, if you really like kind of nitty gritty details, those are also kind of a big part of electrochemistry, I feel like. So it's not just knowing kind of like what a battery is and taking it apart. It's also knowing the chemistry and the chemical reactions that are happening beyond and inside the actual battery. Um, so having that fundamental knowledge is also critical, I think, for this field. Very cool. Um, what is the most fun part about your job? Um, I think for me, um, I mean, I love the research. I love the things they're doing. It's pretty cool doing the SEM. But I think for me, it's really the people that you get to meet. And it's really cool to see how everyone is passionate about what they want to do, right? So here, you're kind of in the atmosphere where everyone's doing a whole different project. And you really find that passion, that love for like that specific thing that people are doing. And you meet very interesting people. So I've had the chance to meet through the chemi electrochemical society who have worked in a wide variety of electrochemical fields, not just things that I know, like batteries, but also, you know, like Alex at BioCenters, things of that sort. And it's very cool to see that, you know, there's so much things out there. And really, you know, we always need, you know, scientists and engineers to kind of go out of every single problem, no matter what it is. You know, just to piggyback back off that a little bit, uh, as Mikhail mentioned, um, you know, it's great to meet a lot of the people. Uh, the electrochemistry community is very tight knit. Um, a lot of the people in the community know each other and know each other's resource research. So to be able to build off of that with your own stuff is very fascinating to do. And, you know, like you read you you read about in the news or read in the paper. Oh, I know that guy. You know, he I were I talked to him at a conference or I you know, we've worked on something together. So to be able to do to see that it's very fascinating for me i guess if you if you have a lot of questions about the world and you're curious and you kind of love that part um this this is my favorite part of the job because electrochemistry is so wide there are days when you know i'm putting on sweatpants and i'm going into the machine shop and i am drilling a hole in a piece of metal and you know i'm doing that kind of machinery stuff um, and then there's other days when, you know, I'm putting on the, you know, the cleanest clothes that I can and holding this very precise sensor and everything is super clean and I'm being very careful. And then, you know, there's other days when you're at the computer, you're not anywhere in your lab, you're doing the data analysis and you're kind of looking at the little time points and you're like, does that one matter? Does that one matter? How does that work? Um, so it really gets you going and moving in a lot of different um, fields. And I think that's the best. And in within electrochemistry, um, because you have to, you know, be able to do so many different things, you're well equipped and you have a lot of different talents that I think are, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah, I think you touched on something that is um, pretty widespread. I don't want to say completely universal as a career as a scientist, but, but super widespread and that you do a lot of different things. Like you're not just doing one task every single day over and over and over again. Like yeah, like one day I was a plumber as a squid biologist and the next day I was in the ocean collecting a squid and the next day I was writing a grant and like, yeah, it's all over the place. And so that's one of the fun things about being a scientist for sure. Um, so, all right, we, okay, I, I, this is like a person who obviously does not know a lot about, about this, but I know that one of the limitations that I heard, and this might be like a 10 year old statement, but uh, of a lot of clean energy things, including wind farms and solar panels and all of this stuff like and electric cars in particular is that one of our limitations is the amount of power that a battery can store and how many times you can use it before it is dead and so i know miguel you mentioned that one of your goals is to make them longer live but like what has happened in the last 10 years with batter 10 years with batteries and what do you want to see happen in order to make like the batteries not be our limiting reagent anymore with clean energy. Yeah. Um, so 
I think I can answer that in two folds. Um, one thing is in terms of like the, what happened in the past 10 years, there's really been an explosion of new technologies in terms of the battery field. Um, really, there's two things that kind of limit the capacity of the battery. One is the liquid electrolyte and two, the actual active materials that hold the charge, right? And what I mean by that, so in a lithium ion battery, which is the one that's kind of like the most, you know, high, highly discussed, the way they essentially you store charge is you're putting lithium inside a structure, right? So traditionally people use graphite, which is you can imagine like a bookcase. So every single lithium that you put, is kind of like a book going inside a bookcase, right? So there's a very defined structure of how much lithium you could put. However, new sort of generations, high capacity anodes um, use a different sort of mechanism. So instead of being kind of like a bookcase with a very rigid structure, you're putting it into like a sponge. So as you can imagine, a sponge can hold and expand the volume um, and it's not as rigid as you can. So the more volume that you have, you know, like a sponge holds water, instead of in this, in our active materials that we use, it's lithium. So you could hold it more and more and more charge, right? So that creates, you know, you could have theoretically 10 times the more capacity if you use the exact same sort of mass at a per mass level. Um, the issue with that, as you can imagine with a sponge, a sponge expands a lot, right? So even though you do have a high volume, a high charge capacity, you have huge volume expansion that eventually break apart and essentially the charge overall starts going down substantially, right? So in terms of, you know, the past 10 years, really what's been kind of driving at is how can we employ these sort of materials that we know exist that can last for a couple of cycles and really make it last longer. So essentially what people are doing, and there's a lot of startups and a lot of research on this, that um, for silicon and things like that, really the key is either changing the structure such that you could have these volume expansions and not break, or make polymers, which are basically just, um, you could think of it kind of like plastics or long sort of molecules that essentially have a cage around the active particles such that when it expands, it doesn't break, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you have this sort of cage as it expands and expands, you can have a stable stability in the sort of cycles and you could keep that high capacity over a long period of time, right? So my current research, for example, is kind of working on that. So I use electronically conductive polymers um, to kind of mitigate these volume expansion. And there's a lot of startups um, out there that have been kind of employing similar sort of structures. So it's really just a matter of tuning kind of like the mechanical properties and obviously continuing the high, you know, electronic conductivity and all that stuff. But that's kind of like what's happened in the last 10 years. Um, another thing that I'll kind of like to add just a little bit is batteries are good energy sources depending on what you're trying to do, right? So they're perfect for cars, right? Um, for consumer electronics, you know, phones and things like that. But on a wider level, we definitely need, um, batteries is not kind of like the cure all to everything. You definitely need a lot of multiple different sort of um, technologies to kind of bridge the gap between how you need energy storage, whether you need it in a daily cycle or maybe at a multiple week cycle, different winter cycles, you know, fuel cells become more important as you get bigger and bigger for like grid storage and things of that sort or small plants. Um, you have hydro being very important as a storage system for, you know, bigger sort of scale. So it really depends on what scale you're trying to store energy. Um, and batteries are more suited for like the sort of smaller scale where you really need, you know, high density. So, you know, cars, phones and things of that sort. And something that you use kind of like on a daily sort of case, I would say those are like the best sort of applications for batteries. Awesome. Oh, so also kind of in the last 10 years, as Miguel was mentioning, for batteries themselves, batter, like, I don't know if you remember, you know, about 10 years ago, but we really didn't see many, I don't really see any, you know, battery power, you know, full scale cars, very few. Like that. So what, you know, people have been, get, been able to try to work on the scaling up of these different applications. So, you know, lithium ion batteries were invented in 1991. You know, in that 18 years from, you know, 10 years ago to now, a lot of what's been worked on is not only to make those, as Miguel mentioned, try to improve the, the chemistry side of the electrolyte, as well as trying to make sure you can put more and more lithium to be able to make the charging capacity better. It's also trying to, to engineer those batteries so that you can put them in an actual application. So the, you know, not just for batteries as well, for fuel cells, I mean, fuel cells were not, were, were around, but they weren't really used in large scale applications as much 10 years ago. Whereas we're starting to move towards that, you know, now we're at a very interesting moment, I think, in, um, you know, a, applied electrochemistry. Awesome. All right, we have a question, a really practical question here uh, from um, Smithers, British Columbia. 
uh, in Canada. Um, this is a seventh grade class up in Canada. Um, what do you like? We know that we're not just supposed to take batteries that are used, like our uh, like a like a double A battery or what have you, and chuck them in the trash. Why is that? And uh, what are we supposed to do with them? So the main reason for that is that some of the battery components can be toxic. Um, so if you just throw a battery out into the trash, um, not only is it, you know, you could potentially, if that battery has been, you know, compromised or if it has been opened up, those toxic components could get into the environment. There's also, depending on the battery type, there can be, you know, valuable metals in there. There can be something that you'd want to recycle. So the ideal way to dispose of a battery is that there are battery recycling sites. I'm not sure how it is in British Columbia, but I know, you know, in the U.S., there are areas that you can, you know, there's, there's, there's sites that you can go to to drop off your batteries. Um, you know, not only just your, your standard AA batteries that you'd find, as we were mentioning earlier, but especially if you're using, if you're trying to recycle lithium ion batteries and like your computer or something that you really want to recycle that. Um, not, not only because of the you know, valuable metal, but also because of um, the toxicity concerns. So, so okay, we've got a, a thing that holds some liquid and inside the liquid, we have either nickel ion or lithium ion or what have you. And then over time, that liquid is unable to hold a charge as effectively. And so you can't use it anymore. Okay, that I, I'm on board so far. So can you reuse the lithium ions and nickel ions? It's not as though, is it that, like what part breaks down and is unable to, to do it anymore? Um, so it really depends on the type of battery um, and what what the internal chemistry is. Um, usually for like AAA batteries, stuff like that, those are like alkaline batteries, right? And eventually what ends up happening is there's always some side reactions. No, no battery is 100% efficient, right? So there's these side reactions that occur like on the surface and those basically use up kind of like the chemicals that you wanted to use, right? So essentially at the end of the, at the end of the license, you have a lot of different just gunk that's kind of floating around or on the surface. It doesn't allow you to be able to use anymore. Um, that could be one sort of mechanism that you have. Um, another one is that liquid, you know, part of those side reactions sometimes can produce small amounts of gas and things of that sort. And as you can imagine with those gas, that's why they're, I don't know if you noticed, but it's really hard. Do, do not try this, but it's very hard to actually puncture a battery, right? Because it's very like compressed under a lot, a lot of force to go into the inside. And that's because there's a gas, right? So that gas sometimes could create expansions and literally delaminate the actual electrode if it's big enough. That's why sometimes you see there's batteries that kind of swell. It's really that gas that's causing that. Um, so there's a lot of different modes of mechanism, but it's usually almost always related to like the side products that you don't want, whether it's be on the actual surface or something that's floating in the liquid or the gas that occurs or something called the SCI for like the on batteries. It really is almost usually the side products that you don't want it, that either change the chemistry of the reactants that you want or some sort of, you know, the electric surface. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. All right. We got a question here uh, from B. Schultz. Uh, do you think that there will be more storage and battery technology in the future through finding new materials that hold charges better than the ones that we currently know about or through improving the mechanism with the materials that we already know about? Well, I think it's kind of both. Um, so there's constantly people doing more and more research on trying to find newer and better, you know, chemicals themselves to be able to make these batteries and various other electrochemical, you know, systems more efficient. Um, you know, there's cost like Miguel can, can comment more. He knows more uh, on this than I do, but the, um, in terms of the actual mechanism, you know, the, the system itself, you know, they are efficient, but they can always be improved. And, you know, as time goes on, I think we'll see, I think there's more room in the chemical side, um, but both sides can be improved. Yeah. And just to add, um, in terms of chemical side versus the actual mechanism, it really depends on what you're trying to use your battery for. As you can imagine, the ideal battery would be different for like a application for a car where you need to, you know, accelerate and decelerate very quickly at any given moment of time versus something that is more, you know, constant, like a watch, like an Apple watch or something like that, that just kind of uses a standard sort of battery. So really, you know, the materials and the mechanism kind of go on hand in hand onto what use you're actually trying to use. Um, in terms of material, there's a lot of things in the future that are very exciting. 
um, furthering, you know, actually commercializing silicon, lithium metal um, by itself. Solid electrolytes are becoming a very hot topic. Um, also, just because it's much less toxic, and you know, if there's any mechanical failure, stuff like that, it, it won't explode. Um, um, there's also, um, in terms of mechanisms, there's ways to like, you know, recycle, not use such like fine um, silicon or like fine sort of things and just recycle it from different sort of processes. So really it's a combination of both that I think we'll get to like, but in the future being, you know, much more reliable and much higher capacity and overall be much safer, which is always something that is important to consider. Safety for us in the battery world, very, very important for us. We're always thinking of ways to make it safer for the end user. Awesome. Thanks. All right. We got another question from 802 in Brooklyn. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. Well, I'll ask questions and I'll ask another one pretty quickly after. One, do you all currently live in Georgia? Yes. Awesome. So you were mentioning, well, uh, Alex was mentioning before uh, the session began that you two had, uh, you two being uh, John and Miguel, had been like working with Tesla. Is that like, could you tell us a little bit more about what you've done with them and, and like, how you get into a career where you're working with Tesla. And I think John actually, John did a lot of like um, lab, lab work with UC. UC Berkeley, I, I worked at a Berkeley. national lab. Um, yeah. I worked with, I worked for the, uh, did some research for the government. Cool. Um, so, and did you have to go to California to do that or could you do that from Georgia? It depends on what you're doing. So my work was about half virtual, half, um, you know, in person. Mm -hmm. um, so I did go to, I did go to Berkeley, California and worked at the lab. Uh, there's about, there's 17 national labs throughout the U S uh, that each do different types of research. So the research, my research was specifically on something called an electrolyzer, which can be thought of the reverse of a fuel cell, um, where you're making water instead, uh, or excuse me, where you're making hydrogen and oxygen instead. Um, my it's, it was a lot of that, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very tight knit community. Um, so I actually met the person that I worked with. Uh, he was a friend of my advisors, and we were able to work together uh, on this kind of research. But um, in terms of, you know, getting those opportunities, a lot of times you can just, you know, you can reach out to pe people. People are more typically happy to help you. Um, mm -hmm. People want you to succeed. So if you want to reach out to us, you can re there's we'd be happy, you know, be happy to, you know, happy to help in any way we can. And people typically, as long as you're, you know, willing to learn, um, people are ha we're happy. People are happy to help. Great. Sounds good. Yeah. Reach out to people, be, uh, put yourself out there. The worst that could happen is you get ignored, uh, at least at the beginning. Um, when you get in deeper, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, all right. The next question is from Tina. Um, what is the difference between hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and electric vehicles? So in terms of, uh, like, in terms of the what a what a hydrogen and hydrogen is only really used right in the in terms of North America in California, uh, there have there are not as many fueling stations throughout the U.S. for hydrogen itself. Um, there is a lot more in Japan, and there's starting to be more in China. I'm not quite sure on Canada, but I think it's mainly in California in the U.S. In terms of the differences between an electric car, you know, that you'd see from a Tesla, or in terms of a battery powered car versus what you'd see in a fuel cell car. Um, the range of a battery car, you know, it really depends. Um, it is, a battery car typically is more local um, around town. Uh, there are, for a hydrogen car, you can get longer ranges, um, but in term, the technology itself, there is some commercialization. Toyota is really the, um, the innovator in this field, um, but it's still quite new. Um, in terms of how far you can go. The main difference between the two cars is that for a hydrogen car, it's very similar to what you'd see in a, you know, uh, in like a, an engine, a car engine that you, you have instead of just having, you know, an engine, you'd have a fuel cell powering the car. And instead of putting gasoline in your gas tank, you'd put hydrogen and then you'd run that. You just, instead of making, you know, CO2 emissions or any kinds of emissions, you'd make water instead. Um, that would be, instead of coming out of your car as, you know, you know, gas coming out of your car, you got hydrogen or water coming out of your car. And the difference in terms of a battery power car, you would just charge your, it would, it would be very similar to if you're charging any electronic. You just have, you would take, you know, you, you, you have a charging station and you fill up your car overnight to see how much charge you can get. Cool. So 
are the fuel cell vehicles like dripping all the time? Like wh where's all the liquid going? The liquid is mainly coming out as vapor. So you okay, would have okay. water vapor coming out of the car because the temperature you're typically running at is around, um, it's around 200 Fahrenheit coming out of the car. Um, so it's, it's, it's typically going to be, it's going to be a gas coming out of the car. Cool. Um, we've got another really interesting question here from B. Schultz. So thinking about, you know, all the lithium, the nickel or, or what have you that we're using, where does that all come from? And like, what considerations do we have to take into consideration for like mining of those things? Like how does that, the mining of the ingredients for the batteries affect environments and, and all of that? Like what, what do we have to worry about there? Yeah. So yeah, as you, as you kind of alluded to most precious metals come from like mines, right? Um, some of them are mined directly. Some of them are just byproducts of other things that are mining. Um, and that's why there's a big push right now in, I would say, the batter community and the sustainability community really to try to see, okay, once we mine it, how can we reuse this multiple times? And I remember, I think John mentioned a little bit of this, this, in part of the, the mechanism sort of work, not just the new materials, it's really trying to see, you know, that's why it's very important to give back batteries to recycling centers so we could use and reuse that sort of precious metal, so the nickel, the cobalt, um, part of the lithium, things of that sort. Uh, so it's very important, you know, to find new ways to recycle it. And there are actually new startups coming out of California and New York specifically that are trying to use, you know, old batteries. They collect, you know, iPhone batteries, um, anything that's in your laptop, things of that sort, to reuse it again. And it can make batteries with as much as 90% efficiency, 95% efficiency. So really, we are totally pushing towards that. And really, you know, having some sort of standard uh, mod modular sort of system in place such that it could be eventually we could reach to like a full circle economy. That would be the ideal. Um, unfortunately, um, we haven't reached that point yet. There's a lot of research and a lot of people trying to figure, figure that sort of thing out, but it's something that is very important. And it's always kind of in the minds when we are making new sort of um, creations for materials and things of that sort. Um, I know for a lot of things recently, you know, I work in not cobalt-based, um, a cathode or anode, more iron-based, which is common, much more common everywhere. And it's much easier to extract from the ground without having a lot of sustainability, environmental impact. So we were, it's something that we're always thinking about as we're creating new materials and really pushing the design of battery performance. Awesome, cool. I had no idea iron could work for that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Miguel, next, or go, go sorry. I, I was gonna go on to the next uh, question, so go ahead. Oh yeah, Miguel also brought a very point is that, you know, in, you know, elect, as you know, as we mentioned earlier, you know, what happens in the last 10 years, um, a big, some of these reactions are really, really slow. Um, without using something like a precious metal, like platinum or palladium. So some of the, well, one of the pushes of the last, you know, 10 years is trying to make it so that you can start using, you know, much more common metals. So you don't have to take not only these primal metals that are at a small capacity, so they're very expensive. They're also hard to mine. They're also environmentally damaging to mine. So to be able to use something like iron um, or, you know, other kinds of very common metals, uh, like zinc, um, you'd be able to, if you can do that, um, you know, you'd be able to get a, you know, efficient battery and you know, that would, that's very valuable. And okay. a quick note on that. So I think it's about like 40 to 49% of the cost of like an electric car is the battery itself. And um, as far as like the precious metals go that John was talking about. So if you have like platinum, platinum is very good at kind of reducing oxygen. So it can make that water. Um, but what happens is the oxygen actually has to touch that platinum. It has to actually physically get to the surface. But over time, you can imagine there's things like chlorine and other, other little particles that start to get in the way. And of course you have this very expensive platinum that you really want to do this reaction and over time you start to get these um, this fouling effect and so the battery starts to get worse and worse cool um so alex i have a question for you that i if you can't answer it's okay but you said you're working with bacteria yep. um i've heard that there are some bacteria that people are making batteries out of uh what and how Right. My, they're called microbial fuel cells, and I actually saw a talk on this. Um, they're thinking, they actually, they've started doing even more with them. So in Hawaii, they grow bacteria that will um, make molecules that have electrons. 
um, and they'll actually make proteins as well. So they're thinking of actually harvesting the bacteria and making them into like protein bars. Um, but as far as the electrical energy goes, what happens is there's two different ways that bacteria can um, function in this microbial fuel cell. So the first is they can start to consume like sugars and stuff like that and make really reduced molecules and they can ship them off kind of like little satellites. And this all happens without oxygen being present. So it's kind of like this little, this little fuel cell, the bacteria are metabolizing um, the molecules and they will send it off. The molecules will touch um, the anode and then they'll go all the way to the cathode. And so that movement of electrons is that electricity. And usually the cathode is somewhere where there's oxygen. So the oxygen will actually take those electrons. Um, and so that's one way they can do it. The other way is they can, they have these pili, so they kind of have like these little fingers and they'll like come over and they'll swim and they'll sit on the anode and they're kind of like wires. So they'll transfer the electrons directly onto the anode. Um, so there's two, there's these two different ways um, and they're still trying to figure out um, because these are living things, you know, you can kill them. Some of them don't like oxygen. Um, and they've actually even started to um, do genetic engineering. So like they'll, they'll be like, here's a bacteria, but we want them to do these very specific reactions. So they'll actually be like, oh, you can't do this anymore. You can't do that anymore. You're going to just do this one thing for us and you're going to make energy. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's expanded quite a bit. Awesome. Cool. All right. Our next question is from Adelaide. When was the first battery developed and did it use different metals than the ones that we use now? Um, so I think technically speaking, the very first battery was made in the 1600s and it was Whoa. very simple, like copper, essentially. They use copper, copper, and then basically just like a water with a bunch of like different salts. And that was the first thing that gave a potential difference. Um, obviously we've expanded we've improved a lot since then um commercially speaking um batteries have started started to be made you know progressively for like actual uses more than just you know cool science experiment things like that in the early 1900s um they were like the pr primitive sort of batteries um and then what was the second question other than the when they were mm. creating Oh, are they, were back then they made from something else than the, what they're made now, but you answered that. It was salt yeah, then, yeah. and it's, yeah, yeah. it's a different. They're very different um, from demonstrations. Um, in terms of like what typically use, and one of the first ones more well established that was actually commercialized were like the lead batteries, similar to kind of like the ones that we have in cars. Those have uh -huh. been around also for almost a hundred years. Um, and it really, like I said, yeah, I think previously, um, the use that you want to use it for, so like the characteristic of the electricity that you want to draw from it, really kind of dictates what materials and what sort of battery they're going to use. Um, as we go more in the future and things are becoming more and more specialized, it really, you know, we're good with the thing. It was like, what are the key characteristics that I need to come out of the battery? And then after, once you realize what you need um, in terms of power output, you know, longevity, things of that sort, then you can start designing the actual battery for specific for that purpose. There's no really catch all batteries um, anymore as we're trying to go to more specialized performance characteristics. Cool. Awesome. Um, let's see. Okay. Here's a question and I'm going to, uh, okay. From Malaysia, what happens when batteries are in water and you put them in a remote, but I, I also wonder like, why can't you just like use a battery underwater? Why does it have to be like dry? So a big problem with that is that if you, so if you have, so think of like a remote and you have, you put the two batteries in and you see that little swiggle thing that the battery is supposed to line up against and you see the other part of the battery. If you're in water, um, now let's say you're doing, you're doing water that's just pure water, there's nothing else in it. Water is a very, water has a very, instead of, you know, water is very resistant without anything added to it. So if you just put water, if you just put two batteries, like if you just, you just had the remote opened up and you got the two batteries in there, you just had them in water, there's not enough electrical contact between the two ends of the battery and what puts in, what gives the, what allows the battery to give power to the remote for it to actually work. Now, we don't typically deal with perfectly pure water. So if you were to put, uh, you know, two batteries inside of something and you wanted to charge it, um, 
if you had a concentrated enough water, the reason why they tell you not to use things underwater is that you could potentially shock yourself. Right. Um, now Ooh. the, uh, so if you, now the power output is probably not very high, but if you did something that had very high output, you could potentially shock yourself. Yikes. So, okay, let's say this is hypothetical and, and no one should try this at home ever, but if you had ultra, ultra, ultra pure water, yeah. would you not shock yourself then? Like if, if, if you drop, not a hair dryer, cause that's a lot of energy, but like in a normal tap water situation where you get zapped because the water is touching something, like you wouldn't get zapped. Yeah, yeah because you got it. Whoa. Yeah. Conduct electricity, yeah. Because it needs the stuff to be conduct. To conduct electricity, yep. Wow. That's cool. Okay, very cool. Um, all right. My question is power grids. Um, how big are the, like, what? what is storing the energy that then gets sent to all of our houses? Like, I see these energy, like, I don't know what they're called, but like the facilities that store the energy power around plant. the country, like how big are those and how big is the battery and like, how, and is it even a battery and, and how do they store energy like that for so many people? So we're starting to move towards using more batteries for that application, but the classical way of doing it is a turbine. So what you do is, so let's say you're, you're running, you're creating electricity. So let's say you're burning coal. You use that coal to, you use the energy that you get from burning coal to run a turbine. So that turbine keeps running. You use, you basically just keeping that energy and you're using that, the running of the turbine to put the electrical, you know, put the electric, you, you use that to create electricity. The electricity then goes into your power outlet and all, you know, where else. There's other technologies of trying to store that in a battery. So you can, so as you were, we were talking before about, you know, about what's inside of that battery in that chemical reaction that creates the energy. How are a rechargeable battery works? is that you basically have some percentage of that reaction that can work. So let's say I have my, my, battery, inside, oh, my battery inside my computer, my rechargeable battery inside my computer is at 0%. Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm going to use, let's say I'm gonna, well, we don't wanna burn coal as much, but let's say we are, and we're burning coal and we create electricity and then we're slowly charging that battery so that it goes back to 100%. Mm -hmm. Some, we can, we can, use, we can then discharge that battery in order to create electricity the same way that we're doing with the turbine. Something called a redox flow battery is, is kind of how that works. In which case you would put that reaction, let's say, put that battery from a 0% state of charge to 100% state of charge and basically oscillate between those two 0 and 100% to be able to give electricity throughout. So um, I'm pretty confident that I've misunderstood this. So we Sorry. are, you're burning coal and mm -hmm. you're turning a thing and then the yeah. turning of the thing creates the energy. Exactly. And then is it the job of the government effectively to make sure that we are creating the same amount of energy that we're using? Um, yeah, that seems, that seems hard. How do they do it? So it's, you could kind of imagine that if you're burning enough, right? You could have, if you like separating two different sections, you always are making a little bit more than what you do, right? And then you could imagine that you could take data. Um, this is where data becomes very important as we go towards like grids, where there's the most usage of energy is really in the early mornings when people are getting ready for work uh -huh. and early afternoons, right? And the reason for that is, as you can imagine, when you're home, you could use a dishwasher, laundry stuff, TVs, and things like that. But when you're at work, everything's like centralized. So the power output is very limited. So all the utility companies, uh, like in Florida, FPL here, Georgia Power and things of that sort, what they do is, if you notice like outside buildings or outside house, there's a little monitor with little numbers that move up. Yeah. So those are usually very like linked to like a central sort of thing. And you kind of predict depending on the time of day and also depending on the season with previous data, when, what sort of energy demand. And obviously the fluctuates up and, up and down a bit, but it's usually very standard. Like you can accurately kind of predict these sort of things. Um, to enough precision that you could create in the power plant enough energy to be able to supply it, right? And obviously, you, it really, you know, you're kind of getting, the, you know, the central energy from the power plants and through the transmission lines, like the cables that you see everywhere and things like that, you distribute it to different sectors that you need it, right? So as long as you have a very well sort of centralized system and a very good distribution channel, um, and where people need it more, you just send more energy there, send more energy here. And it's really kind of like up to the utility companies to kind of manage that sort of thing. 
determine where it all goes. That's awesome. Super cool. Um, I'm impressed that we as humans can accomplish that. That seems like an impressive feat that we all do every day. Um, cool. So uh, I want to touch a little bit more on green energy before we wrap up. Um, and we don't have, a time, have time to get into it too deeply because we try to finish up by 45 minutes. But of all of the non-fossil fuel based energy acquisition approaches that are currently out there, which are you the most hopeful for going forward? I think the answer, I mean, I know this is probably not the answer you want to hear, but it really takes a conglomeration of all of them, depending on where you are. So yeah. for example, wind is a great source of energy, but if it's not very windy where you are, you can't apply that everywhere. Solar is a great form of energy, but if it doesn't sun, if it's, you know, if it rains all the time, if you're in Seattle, or I think we have people from British Columbia and it rains a lot there. Um, you can't always get the sun, you know, in that area. So it really depends on, you know, where you are. And, and how efficient you can get that energy to wherever you need to be. Fair enough. You agree? Yeah, I think, they are, I think John put it on. You need all of them. On the geography that you are and what's available to you. Right. I am currently thinking about putting solar panels on my roof and it is so expensive and I just want the government to help me with it. <laughs> <laughs> it is so I don't know how we're gonna I don't know how we're gonna do it by 2050 but here we are um all right everybody thank you so much oh I have one more question for all of you um if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise what would it be always for me I guess always keep an open mind and always so I think we touched on this there's so many people out there and the field is small um always be open to collaborate with people who are outside <clears throat> sorry I'm like losing my voice um always be willing to collaborate with people who are outside of your field because you know like I work with bacteria I love talking to microbiologists but I also love my electrochemistry friends because they have so much more knowledge about this than I do, um, that it makes the science so much stronger. And when you work together, you know, it's, it's great. It's awesome. You make friends and you love the science even more. Great. Well, look at the three of us. I mean, we work in very different things in electrochemistry, but we all can still speak the same language and talking about science. Mm -hmm. I think having that collaboration, I think is very, you know, very helpful. Great. Anything else? And I think one thing I would say is for every technology, that exist, um, there's, there's probably a use case to what you're gonna use, whether it be here, now, in the future, um, if you really like passionate, you know, entering this sort of field, like there's a lot of times on a day by day where things are not successful, but you kind of just keep pushing on because you know that eventually you kind of reach the, you know, the breakthrough. And I'm very hopeful, you know, for like the future that eventually, you know, we will get to the goal of having stable energy because we kind of have to and we will. Great. I think, you know, one quick, well, one, well, I'll say one quick thing. Um, I think the path to get to science, I think, has always been considered to be, you know, very difficult. You know, lots of schooling, lots of long, hard work. And, you know, I'd want you to know is that you don't have to go through it alone. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of it's, you know, people kind of, you know, prioritize the grind of science. And I think working together, um, stay, like staying positive about your specific work, either in school right now, or as you move through high school or, you know, through college as well, you know, staying positive about that and, you know, getting help if you need it, I think is very valuable. That's great. Knowing when to ask for help is a super important skill. And the earlier you learn it, the better. Um, awesome. Well, thank all three of you for joining us today. Kay, thank you for interpreting. We really appreciate it. I hope you all learned something. I learned a lot because I knew almost nothing about this topic. So I love the, these sessions because I'm learning 100% of the time. Um, awesome, well, thank you. On December 1st, we've got two sessions, one for adults, one for kids. Uh, the one for kids, or kids, students, um, are is at 1 p.m. It's gonna be all about geology with Schmitty Thompson, a wonderful person and geologist who is one of the most passionate science communicators about rocks I have ever met in my life. So that's gonna be a great one. Um, please join us for that. And then also at night at 7 p.m. Um, this one is technically 
for adults, but it's not, it's, it's going to be kids safe. It's just, we might get a little deeper into the weeds than we typically do at Skype a scientist live. We're talking with Dr. Mike Hogan, who is, um, who worked at university of Pennsylvania and now works at children's hospital of Pennsylvania or of Philadelphia. I don't know what chop stands for. I suddenly realized, um, but he it's, was, Philadelphia. It's, Philadelphia, it's Philadelphia. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so he is one of the, the part of the team of scientists who were the first team to put an mRNA vaccine into an animal ever. Um, so, and he also, uh, his work has contributed to the field of mRNA vaccines. And so he's our go-to guy for learning about uh, the COVID mRNA vaccine. He has published on the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine and is a, a just a huge uh, encyclopedia of vaccine and immunology and COVID knowledge. So that's going to be a great one. I hope to see lots of you there. That's at 7 p.m. You can find all of these links both in the chat right now and also on skypeascientist.com. Um, if you can support our program, please do. We are completely donor funded and supported and the average donation is about eight bucks. So it's a lot of people doing a little lift to keep this program going. If you can help, um, go to skypeascientist.com and click donate or go to patreon.com slash skypeascientist to help support us. Thank you everyone for coming and we will see you uh, December 1st. Thanks. Bye. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.